What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from Zoom again. And this time we are here with Patty of As It Is. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to have you here. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be a good time. Cheers. Yeah, it's going to be an awesome time. And we got a lot to look forward to in 2022. We got I Went to Hell and Back coming out uh, this February. You just want to talk about like how the making of this album was. Like, Was your direct intention to just make a direct continuation of, of uh, the Great Depression? Or was this almost kind of like a new beginning for As It Is? Oh man, I mean, there, there's, there's the, oh, I, I don't even know where to start. So, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's so many things. So we, we started writing this thing. It was supposed to be an EP in California in April of 2020. And then it became a full length record that we made over Zoom and Dropbox over like a year and a half. And it's coming out early next year, but it's, it's been like just an ever evolving process but it was um one of the only things that kept me sane during all the lockdowns and the pandemics and things so um but yeah it's uh, stylistically i think there's just enough that's you know similar and different to keep everybody sort of uh interested and engaged but uh it still feels like an as it is record at the end of the day i think that's always important um you know to to experiment and to evolve but to to remain true to your roots and and why people uh, gravitated towards you in the first place. So I think it's it's all of those things. Yeah. It, what's funny is, that, so there's one of two albums that, there's one of two types of albums that have come out over the last year and a half. There were albums that were supposed to be released earlier or were finished before the pandemic that are now getting released and have either been delayed or released anyway. And then there's albums that are what I call COVID babies, which is almost kind of like albums yeah. that were, you know, made either because bands had nothing to do or they used it as a time to finish up the work. So I know it's kind of a whataboutism, but uh, if it's fair to say, had it not been for the events we've had the last couple of years, uh, we would have not gotten I Want to Hell and Back, right? That's right. That's right. We were we were going to be doing an EP because we had uh, a founding member step away. Um, and then it all just, you know, just, we, we just had all this time um, and all these ideas being written. And we just kept it going, essentially, because there was time and there was enthusiasm. So uh yeah here we are it's it's a crazy wild time yeah so was there at all maybe like a preconceived idea of what you wanted i went to hell and back to sound like in a way like you mentioned that there's some elements that we've gotten you know from earlier albums such as the great depression or okay or happily uh never happily ever after um but like uh is was there also a lot of improvising involved with the making of this album yeah yeah a certain amount i mean so so in in late 2019 we were ronnie and i were in um la doing a bunch of like co-writes uh, and writing sessions and studios and things and at least two of the songs that we wrote out there ended up on the record and you know th those help to to shape things you know it, it's it's nice to have so the first single we released from the record is called i don't give a fuck and it was nice to have that as a flagship song where it was like okay we wrote this we love how this sounded um let's let's write a couple more like this and explore um you know, sonic sounds that aren't necessarily represented here, take them further down this. So there's, there's poppier songs and there's much heavier songs. And, um, it was, yeah, it's, it's, it's similar enough to that, but then there's also, you know, a lot of like pop production that we, we really liked bringing in. Um, and a lot of just fun screamy textures lying around in places. So it was, it was, um, there weren't too many like strict rules, but we, we definitely had a sound where it's like, okay, something about this really worked. I think that's the thing is like, that song, I never sort of like wavered in my sort of confidence in it, which which very rarely happens. I'm not always a like confident person. I love to doubt and I love to be like, okay, this this isn't good enough. We should change this. We should panic. But that song for like a year and a half was like, okay, I, I, there's something really special about this. And to release it first made a lot of sense. And to use it as the sort of blueprint for the record made a lot of sense too. Mm -hmm. And it's it goes without saying that maybe the making of this album has opened up even more doors for as it is in the future, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in the sense that, you know, there's been a lot of collaboration. It's done wonders for like numbers and playlisting and streaming and all that sort of stuff. Um, but really, it was it was just really cool to, to meet a lot of new people through this record. Um, say more yeses than noes on this record. Um, and yeah, to just like really spend the time and get excited again, because, you know, I love touring it's it's one of my favorite parts about what we do but to just like be at home and have nothing but like time and and hours to like devote to this record made it made it really special it's not something we, we would have done otherwise for sure 
as a vocalist, have you always needed to hear the music in order to come up with lyrics, or can you sometimes have like a lyrical idea that could influence the direction of the sound of the song? Oh, it's really cool that you ask because it's like when I, whenever it's like pen to paper, it has a melody. It's like the, the melody is going onto the page as well. So it's like everything, every line I write has like a syncopation and a melody attached to it. So that often does form whole sections and whole songs. Um, but I am a bit of like a music theory geek in the sense that like, oh, I like knowing which chords are there because it's then restrictive in a good way going like, oh, okay, this is the note we have to like start and end on essentially. And you know, how high and low can we go? Um, yeah. So um, like, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting that you say that because it can work both ways, but when I write a lyric down, it's, it's, it's never without a melody or a syncopation or a rhythm attached to it. If you know what I mean? Have you ever had like the best lyrics ever? And then they're always like one syllable over like the actual arrangement of every song. Oh yeah. So many times, so many times and you've got to like tweak it or you've got to like rush it in or something like that. It, 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 it sometimes you got to massage it a little bit to get it to work for sure. Yeah. Now, do you like, do you prefer to leave uh, lyrics open to interpretation or do you try to engage the listener into, because when I listen to an as it is song, I can tell that you're not just, you know, writing gibberish at this song, it, that this, every song does have meaning, at least how, how I interpret it. So do you try to like engage the listener into the lyricism as much as the song or do you kind of like to leave that open-ended? It's Yeah, again, it's super cool that you ask. Great question. So it's like, um, on our three previous records, and it isn't untrue of this record, but they're, they're, there's a very like poetic style to the to the lyrics that Ben and I would write. Um, and you know, a lot of things are like drenched in in metaphor and or like hyperbole or whatever. But it's just sort of with this record, um, there was a certain amount of just like anger and hopelessness that was like better communicated through just like saying it as it was just like oh like let's just be like blunt and candid and transparent like let's not like dress it up so that it like looks pretty like let's just show how like gross like revolting and uh and just th these feelings are um and that was uh, interesting because it's like for me I love when lyrics just look and read like poetry um, but certain lyrics on this record are just like ugly and it was cool to like embrace that in a sense and there is still some of the like the poetry and um, a lot of like really fun wordplay to mess around with but it was it was really cool to just be like really blunt and really candid and just yeah just just raw i guess is the word i'm looking for um that was really cool that was a really cool change with this record for sure i think there's i think like uh when lyrics are metaphorical or literal i think they're both equally strong they just express it differently i think there's uh being very blunt and literal or in your face with the lyrics have, i mean from what you're telling me this sounds like a very this almost sounds like a hardcore album yeah in a sense in a sense yeah very much so and it's 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 been a cool learning curve in the sense that you know in different records i've written about like you know familial relationships like my relationships like my parents and my sister and stuff and you know references by name and then you sort of you sort of uh wonder like okay is this only going to be personal to me is anybody going to find themselves in this because this is my like unique individual relationship and then everybody sort of identifies with with that feeling in some way or another so it then leads you to say like oh i can just write about anything at all and i can just write about like how gross my mind feels today and how difficult this has been and everybody's going to find themselves in it you don't have to cons i always i i've also learned that um just sort to, to to be authentic is the most important thing it's like as soon as you start to write with other people in mind it starts to read as pandering and stuff so this has always been just like authentic uh, purely and totally, um, and this record more than more than any other record, I think this is just like my brain stuck inside, struggling, and that's what you get, and that's what you're going to hear. And I think you know everyone all over the world has had that experience this year, so it's 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 got to be universal in that respect. But not trying to for a second. Yeah. Now, being that you know artists, you know artists, a lot of artists have been isolating uh, before it was cool in 2020, but like. Uh, but do you prefer to write lyrics and think of these melodies when you're more like alone and there's nothing in between you and your process? Or do you prefer to maybe have like an additional band member uh, aside to, you know, maybe help bring some input in a way? 
I definitely think that just me being alone um, does make me stronger where I have a lot of time to put aside and to just look inward. Um, there's always that feeling when you're when you're penning like lyrics in the studio and everybody's just waiting on you to finish a lyric and you can just feel their like their stares and like the side of your head you know that everybody's just waiting for this lyric to get done and it was one of the coolest things about this record is because our uh, Ronnie and our producer Zach were both based in the US and our bassist Ali and myself were based over here in the UK so uh, we wouldn't start working on the record here until between like 4 and 6 p.m., which was awesome, and it meant I had the entire day to just, like, get shit wrong and get shit wrong until it was right. Um, and that was really cool to just, like, have that sort of, like, space and freedom to, like, do that and really get it right eventually because there's nothing worse than a lyric where you know, like, you you, you totally missed. Like, you wanted to say this thing, but it's now just forever <laughs> on the song and you wish you could change it. So um, that was really fun. I, I don't I don't see that ever happening again, but I'm glad it happened for this record, yeah. Do, do ideas like come out of nowhere or do you almost have kind of like a usual realm or a usual uh, place that you like to go to to cultivate ideas? Yeah, no, they, they come from similar places and you know, there's like the notes app is just filled, like, like you, you, sometimes you take from it, but sometimes it's just like a graveyard where like all your like lyrical ideas go to die and they never leave. But like sometimes every once in a while you, you pull from there. Um, and yeah, just sometimes the first thing that comes out of your head uh, is the inspiration for the whole song. But a lot of the times it's me just like filling two pages before it's it's anywhere near cool. And then you just sort of expand upon that and yeah, get that to get that to be exactly how you want it to be. I'd imagine uh, inspiration sometimes strikes at the most inconvenient times, right? It totally does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it keeps you up, sometimes it wakes you up. But yeah, there's that's the thing is 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 trying to be like creative from nine to five like there, there's no way there's no way you can do that you can yeah you know, sometimes you get lucky but most of the time they can't really be constrained like that i mean you could create from nine to five but i i think it's more insanity than it is creativity and i think there is a fine yeah. line like I, i've always said right. inspiration and insane or insanity uh sounds partially similar for a reason you know I th yeah i think that's right i think that's right that's funny i like yeah. that now, uh, you, you referenced poetry before, and I had a good discussion with an English teacher one time saying that, like, all songs are poems, but not all poems are songs. Do you almost kind of, like, agree with that sort of saying? Like, do you consider every song to be poetry in a way, or do you think that there's structurally, sometimes it's so different that it, you know? I love that. I think that's really cool. That's really interesting, and it hits my ear good, so, it's, uh, so I expect that that probably is true. And it's similar can be said for, like, for art, you know, it's like sometimes, you know, is is every song art? Is every musician an artist? I would say probably so. You know, things that are on the Disney Channel are still ultimately art. It's like just because it's not as like deep as I don't know some like hardcore record or whatever. It's like it doesn't have to be. It's like it, it's it's achieving the, the the goal that it was set out there to achieve. For goodness' sake, so I, I think I think that probably is true, and I really like that conversation. Conversations like that are always super interesting to me. Yeah, well, all songs are poetry, or all songs may be poems, but all poems are art in a way. I think anything that results in a creative experience that's shared with an individual that opens discussion and uh, enlightens or deepens somebody, or even alters their perceptions of reality, makes it art one way or another. I love that. I think that's sick. Yeah, yeah. Totally agree. Totally Thank agree with that. Thank you. I was totally winging that. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, now, um, when it comes to like all these albums that you have, because now this is your fourth album, does it almost get like a little bit harder to put a set list together when playing live? And do you feel that maybe when you're playing songs off of Never Happy Ever After or OK or The Great Depression or Now, do you think that maybe when you combine them together, that almost alters the context of the songs or the albums in a way? I, yeah, I totally agree. I do think it gets increasingly more and more difficult to, to put a set list together. And I remember, you know, when we had like a bunch of EPs and like one record around the corner, we were like, oh, I can't wait until we have so many more songs and putting a set list together is going to be so much more interesting because it can change from tour to tour and it can look like so much more diverse. But it's like, I don't know how many songs we have at this point, but yeah, with four records and a bunch of EPs and things, it's like, oh, putting a set list together you know you're not going to please everybody. It's like when, when you totally miss somebody's like city on a tour, it's like, we're going to skip that song that means the world to you. Um, 
and that sucks that totally sucks we hate doing that but it's it's you know it, uh, we can't play the all four records in full especially when we're like opening for your favorite band it's just sort of like it's uh uh it does get harder and harder and harder um and you never know whether it's about like pleasing you or pleasing the crowd more and but you you just you just do your best ultimately and you you just hope it works but yeah, yeah you're never going to get it right and you just you just got to know that <laughs> yeah unless you're bon jovi who's had the same set list for the last 35 years but that's exactly it yeah that we, uh, we wish we were bon jovi yeah. essentially yeah. yeah their paychecks are a little different so i doubt they even really uh give a shit <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I remember interviewing a band one time and they told me they saw Europe play, that band Europe, and mm -hmm. they had to do the final mm -hmm. countdown twice. They opened with it and they ended with it. Opening with the final countdown is a is a that's a move. Yeah, for better or for worse. That's that's one hell of a move. Yeah, exactly. Now you're ready for the most <laughs> difficult question of the whole interview? Okay, let's go. Yeah, yeah. How do you know when a song is done? Oh my God. Okay. So, so there's no conversation but yeah, this, this record is, is that, that question where, you know, usually, you know, we leave a, uh, a studio after like five to, to eight weeks of being there. The, the second you're, you're out the door of the studio, the song can't really change. I mean, maybe you could send like a voice memo or a WAV, like over email or something, but it's just mixing now. This, this record was like 18 months of, oh, we can change anything we want at any time, um, for better or for worse, and for most of the time worse, because you know that you can work on the song forever. So it goes through infinite changes and you're all on different pages going, oh, I thought we were going to change this. This, this can't be the final version. It's like, are you, you're crazy. That was just a demo. And then it was, yeah, it was wild watching that just sort of like unravel. Um, but it's done now and I'm psyched that it's done now and I'm psyched to like how it turned out and everything. But yeah, a song is, is probably never, do. it's, it's it, that you, you've probably seen uh, some kind of monster, the Metallica thing. That's that thing Lars is saying, right? It's like, when's a song done? When's an album done? Um, it, it is that abstract. It is that, you know, you, you, you could always change it, but ultimately I think sort of recording yeah. and, and, uh, uh, everybody's used to like a final version of a song right like you can change it live but everybody wants to hear the the version they know so once it's been recorded it's essentially sort of you've you've put the nail in the coffin of that in, yeah. in that sense i think lars declared it too done uh too soon though uh, with that snare sound i just had to bring that joke up once at least now that you reference absolutely that man that that yeah. movie is like my favorite that, that's like the, the greatest gift to the alternative music scene for yeah. sure it's yeah the, it's the best thing i mean uh not hating but you're not the first person i interviewed who reference some kind of monster and i just have to reference the saint anger snare sound as a response to it so yeah yeah fair. oh it's rough yeah 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 you know <laughs> and, and but you know i know plenty of people who will say that they love that album and but they'll never say it publicly so well yeah absolutely absolutely yeah <laughs> yep. and one one person in a band i know actually plays that album like if they're on tour for a weekend they'll hear it once if they're on tour for a week they'll hear it twice and if they're on tour for a month they'll hear it four times Jeez, that's crazy. Just some of those songs are just so long. Like, it's an apart 80, from like it's an eighty minute album. Issues, apart from like even separating like the crazy lyrics or whatever. Just like like my lifestyle determines my death style and stuff. Like let, let's put that to the side. Some of these songs are just too long. They're they're like my first band too long, and it's just like uh the, yeah again oh i could talk about that album forever but it's uh yeah, yeah it's just crazy yeah i mean it's an 80 minute <laughs> album so like somebody will be playing it and be like dude like we're still listening to this still the same song still the same record it's like oh my god let's listen to anything else yeah but hey there's a benefit to that like i was at opeth last saturday and i was 40 minutes late to their set and i only and i made it just in time for the second song so <laughs> i love that and that's awesome true story too <laughs> true story um mm. and uh i have uh, two more questions uh just talking more about the live presence of as it is but um when it comes to lo playing live is there maybe a similar energy that you channel into your live performance as you do when you're songwriting is there at all any similarities in between that or do you consider them two separate games altogether no i'd say i'd say it's pretty similar um every time we're writing something it is i do picture the live set and i do think that's ultimately the mentality of like uh a rock musician is just sort of like oh we this thing we we build these songs to play them like live like that is what these songs are for is to be played live in front of people um 
so it's very much you, you write the songs with certain moments in, in mind um, and they sound that way because live they will translate. Um, and yeah, that was really interesting writing them during a pandemic, not really knowing when live music was going to come back. But it's made me all the more excited to, to play these songs in front of people because that was where my head was uh, the entire time writing them. It's like, OK, these are these are made to be played in like clubs and theaters and in front of hundreds to thousands of kids. That's where they belong. Absolutely. Yeah. But when it comes to like playing live, I mean, not to undermine it at all, but like, you know, it is taking a song that you wrote and you're just replicating it in a live setting. And sometimes you're doing that for weeks or months on end. So is there really anything creative about playing live? I know it's fulfilling, it's energizing, it's exhilarating, but like, is there anything remotely creative about it by having such a repli uh, replicating element to it? Yeah, and probably not, and probably even less so for me because I, 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 I've taken on this approach for better or for worse where um, it's all the things that I, I say and do are sort of slowly crafted throughout a record cycle where it's like, oh, I know exactly what to say in this like two beat moment of the song and exactly like what to do with my body when the, the this is about to drop and stuff. And it becomes more like a stage production, like a play where it's like, okay, it's the same every night because it's really good. Um, and it's just sort of like, oh yeah, you don't keep playing the songs that go down like a lead balloon live. Like, okay, like they're, they're, they're not, they didn't translate, that's fine, but let, let's play the songs that do translate every night in every room and let's do the things that translate every night in every room and it becomes this this just bulletproof set that you build between like on the like six to like 18 months maybe 24 months like just a full record cycle it's like oh you figure it out and you could take this anywhere from support sets to headline sets and it just kills like that's what i enjoy most so it's probably the least creative version of live performance like i was never like a jam guy like band practice and songwriting for me was never like let's jam and like no uh offense or discredit to anybody who's like a jam musician that's fine but for me it was just like oh like streamline everything calculate everything anything that doesn't have to be there cut it like just as quick and as raw and as powerful as you can make it like that's that's the one that's yeah. the winner for sure yeah and i mean do you almost have to like practice crowd interaction and stage presence and like stage banter in a way as much as like practicing the material yeah i do and it and it sucks like it, it's not it doesn't like feel fun when you're just sort of like imagining you're on stage when you're practicing in like your your living room or the rehearsal space or whatever but that is ultimately what the show is for and it ultimately makes the show better. So it's worth embarrassing yourself in front of either only you or your bandmates or whoever, because because it's it's for the live show. You want the live show to kill. Yeah, yeah. I'd you know, we every there's no any frontman who says that they've never done this is lying. We've all practiced in front of the mirror here and there, right? Yeah, completely, absolutely, yep. has to be done. And because of your sound, uh, it almost seems like I, I could see as it is on a tour with like multiple bands. Like I could see you on a tour with like maybe a, like an I Prevail or Bring Me the Horizon. But I could also see you on a tour with maybe like a Kill Switch Engage or an All That Remains or something like that. Have you noticed maybe different types of audiences or maybe different reactions to you, the music depending on the tours? Oh the yeah, band? absolutely. And and you do sort of cater it a little bit to each tour like we we in a sort of so so we went directly from a tour supporting a band called set it off who are very sort of pop rock and poppy and then we went straight out to support silverstein and that was very much like okay like we'll add a few more like screamy moments and everything that i ask of people is a lot more just sort of like hardcore uh influenced and things um one as well was like we went out directly from supporting against the current who are very much like a, just a pop band to supporting some 41 on their sort of like comeback tour and that was like oh okay like nobody cares about the opening band that like the some 41 com comeback tour it's like but it means that you just change almost everything about like who you are um who you sort of like present yourself as um to to just like get the job done and win people over um and that's interesting that's like probably got some sort of like psychological sort of breakdown that i'm not clever enough to to, to get into but it's um yeah it, it it's it's fun to sort of 
you, you, the first like one to four shows, you're really just in uncharted territory and you just have to work it out and it's trial by fire. But that does make it kind of fun because yeah. when it all goes south, like it goes south in a big way and you just like hold on to each other and you're like, okay, well, it's going to suck, but we'll get through it. Do, challenge yourselves even more. Do a tour with Cannibal Corpse or like uh, Behemoth. That'd be good fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, oh yeah. And I actually, we did, we did a, a like a, a, a really heavy festival in Belgium called Grass Pop. Grass I think Pop. It was I know called. that. Yep. Yeah, and and we like we were watching like Emperor and like Ramstein and Dillinger Escape Plan and things. But like we were easily like the poppiest band on the thing. But when you just sort of like lean into that and you just sort of address like, oh, thank, like thanks for being here. Like, uh, like it's it's just when you just acknowledge that you don't really belong i think you you win more people over than trying to just be inauthentic and, and phony it's like uh uh but yeah it was a lot of fun we actually sold a few shirts of that one so that was wild maybe those poppy bands are more metal for doing that maybe they're they're so metal like they 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 make people in in these emperor and cannibal corpse shirts find something within themselves that they never realized that they liked and they either surrender their inner darkness or they hate it so much they become encased in this internal darkness you guys are metal as fuck i like that i'll take it i'll take it your words not mine so i'll take that <laughs> awesome so uh before we go i want to thank you so much for your time and uh, for such an awesome uh, discussion and uh looking forward to the rest of the world hearing uh uh their the new album is there just a uh, Anything else with As It Is that you would like to promote in terms of tours or uh, anything else supporting of the new record cycle? Oh, it's very much just, uh, yeah, check out the record when, when it's here. It's out early next year. But if you're not coming to see us, then, then please, do, well, firstly, do get vaccinated and then go and see some live music because it's, uh, you know, just like our whole industry was hurt so bad. It's not even just about the artists, but, you know, just crew and promoters. Um, it's, and I, I just, I can't wait until it's like back and thriving in a big way. I know it's it's coming back slowly, but we, we only did four shows this year and I am just like so thrilled that we get to tour the world again uh, next year. So yeah, come and see us. And if not us, go and see somebody else because that's why we do this stuff. Hell yeah. Well, thank you so much, everybody. We are here with As It Is. I Went to Hell and Back coming out February 2022 via Fearless Records. We'll see you next time on Heavy New York.